Welcome to Medical Myths, Legends, and Fairy Tales. I'm your host, Dr. Alan Christensen. Look, you know that between the latest online fads and the crazy media headlines, it's easier than ever to get confused about your health. And you and I just want to feel better and live longer. We want to know what works. And we can't wait for further studies. We need to make decisions today based on the best evidence we've got. Well, that's exactly what this show is here for. So let's get to it. Hey, Dr. C here with you. Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, today's guest will be Dr. Diva Boone. This is a super important topic. You know, I was updating some research about vitamin D. I've written about it before quite a bit and its relevance to general health, thyroid health, but there's been so many questions about it since it's been in the media so much regarding COVID. I wanted to do a good update on, you know, what are the best practices for levels to think about. And I stumbled across Dr. Boone's article about people easily getting hypercalcemia, even from mild excesses of vitamin D. You know, I've written before about higher levels being less productive and just less useful, and I've re recommended to avoid them, but it turns out they can also be quite dangerous. So there's a fascinating case story she shares with us, and her background is that of a parathyroid surgeon. She went to Cornell Medical College, did her surgical residency in New York, and endocrine fellow up in Chicago, and then did over 3,500 parathyroid surgeries with the Norman Parathyroid Center in Florida. So her career's uh, transitioning now. She'll be coming to a center in the Southwest to do parathyroid surgery. So I'm happy to hear about that. But please enjoy this discussion I had with Dr. Diva Boone. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Medical Myths, Legends, and Fairy Tales. Dr. Christensen here with you, and I'm glad to be joined by Dr. Diva Boone. Dr. Boone, welcome aboard. Hi, thank you for having me. Hey, so I stalked you after reading your blog post about <laughs> Shannon's story, which was really good. Would you give us a quick recap about, about Shannon and your experience with her? And Sure. Yeah. So, um, so Shannon came to me uh, with kind of a, a medical mystery at the time. Uh, she said that she'd been having all of these issues for, for a few months and, and none of her doctors could really figure it out. She wasn't really getting great answers. Um, she said that, 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 you know, back in the fall, she had started to have these kind of, she'd started to feel tired a little bit or, you know, earlier in the year, um, but then started to have episodes where she felt like she couldn't think straight. She, she was actually put in the hospital for catatonia, which, um, wow. is something that we see with somebody with something like schizophrenia, some very severe, uh, psychiatric disorder, because she really just felt like she couldn't speak, she couldn't uh, get words out, um, and there was nothing wrong with her brain or the, on the scans, and uh, and nothing that the doctors could really pinpoint. And so they gave her this this diagnosis of catatonia, sent her to a psychiatrist, um, but she continued to kind of feel bad. There was really, and it really wasn't very typical. Um, her psychiatrist saw her a few times, didn't really think she had a psychiatric issue. Um, mm. So she said, you know, the one thing that people noticed or had mentioned just kind of in passing was that when, when she was hospitalized a couple of times with catatonia, uh, her calcium level was always high, but it was just a little bit high. It wasn't outrageously high. So her doctors, they, they just kind of said, yeah, this is kind of incidental. Uh, I don't think it's causing the problem. We haven't really figured it out. Uh, so she kind of suspected that that might be it. So she found me online because of this. She looked up high calcium and the most common cause of having high calcium is parathyroid disease. And I'm a parathyroid surgeon, so I'm, I take out these parathyroid tumors all the time. So I get consulted from people who think they have parathyroid disease. So she actually thought, maybe I have parathyroid disease. And the high, high calcium of parathyroid disease can, can cause all of these symptoms. It can cause fatigue, it can cause aches and pains, bone pain, and it can even cause these kind of psychiatric symptoms. So. She thought she'd kind of figured out the problem. Um, when I, when she sent us, or when she sent me her information and I read through it and I talked with her, um, there was something interesting in her labs. Her parathyroid hormone level, which indicates kind of how active her parathyroid glands was actually low, indicating that her parathyroid glands weren't the problem. Um, so then I started asking her about vitamin D and her vitamin D levels were a little bit on the high end, a little too high. Um, they weren't what the lab called toxic, but they were high. And, uh, and I started asking her how long, you know, how much vitamin D she was on. 
and how long she'd been taking it. She was actually just taking 5,000 units a day. Um, she'd been told to take this about four or five years ago by her doctor um, who said, you know, your vitamin Z is a little low, start taking it. And initially she'd done just fine with that. Um, by the time she came to us, her, her vitamin D level was in the eighties on our scale. It's not in toxic range, but I suspected that that was the issue. Um, she actually, when she got sick, she was kind of too sick to even take her vitamin D, which actually saved her because wow. she stopped taking it and slowly her vitamin D levels dropped and her symptoms started to resolve. And I, and I told her at the time, I said, I think all of this is actually due to high calcium. I think, I think the high calcium has caused all of this, even though the high calcium is just a little bit elevated. I think it's caused all of this. And I think it's actually the vitamin D that caused the high calcium. And so I told her, don't, don't touch vitamin D, don't take calcium and we'll let it drop. And that's really what you do. You let that vitamin D level drop it takes months. Um, but over the course of months, it then drops down and then her symptoms completely disappeared. They completely disappeared. So she, she had been successful working. She stopped working when all of this happened. She couldn't get up to go to her job. She couldn't, she couldn't work. Um, but then as soon as the vitamin D level came down, calcium came down, she was back at work. When you talk to her, she's very vibrant. She's very talkative. Um, <laughs> it's hard to believe that this woman ever had a problem talking because, because <laughs> that is kind of her. She's very ebullient and, you know, got a, got a big personality and, um, very yeah. nice woman. So it was a pretty sad story. Um, I've, I've heard other stories like it. The reason why I could diagnose it so quickly is not because I'm some sort of, you know, diagnostic genius. It's because I've seen this a bunch of times, uh, sadly. Um, I see a lot of people now come to us, uh, come to me with high calcium levels. And when I read the story, I always check how much vitamin D level they're on. Mm. And uh, a lot of times we, we see these, you know, people on these very high doses of, of vitamin D, either because they were told to take it or they just saw something on the internet that told them to take all this vitamin D and, uh, and now their calcium's high and now they feel sick because high calcium really will make you feel sick. You will feel tired. You will feel achy. Um, you can start to get heartburn. You can get kidney stones. You can get all these things. Um, and so I've been seeing that more and more. And that's, that's actually why I decided to write these articles about it because I, I got kind of tired of, uh, of seeing it. Um, it's cause it's sad. People are, making themselves sick with, with vitamins. Well, and your article really jumped out at me. I've been talking for quite a while about vitamin D and how certainly you don't want to be deficient in that, but mm -hmm. all the data that I read suggests that some optimal range is not very high. You know, it's probably in the lower within the normal range, but right. what, mid thirties, mid to low fifties, somewhere around right. there. Yeah. Right. And that, and that is what I would, what I would recommend too. Um, vitamin D is very interesting because it's not a vitamin. It actually doesn't meet the definition of a vitamin. A vitamin is something that we need to get from our diet because our body cannot make it, but actually our, our body makes vitamin D. So it doesn't quite meet the definition of a vitamin. And most people don't realize it's a hormone. Um, it's a, it's a steroid hormone. So it looks very similar in the molecular form to other hormones in your body. Um, and, and hormones, as most people know, have a huge effect with just a small amount. Uh, just tiny shifts in hormone levels can produce huge effects. Um, anybody who's had a baby knows that. <laughs> you, you feel those hormone shifts. And so when you think about it that way, it, it makes sense that with vitamin D, just a little bit of it is going to have a big effect. And um, unfortunately, a lot of people think if a little bit is good, a lot is better. And, uh, and, and I see these, these doses of vitamin D just getting higher and higher. Um, uh, but, but you really don't need a lot to, to get what you need. Well, and within this realm of natural medicine, however you want to define that, there are many who advocate blood levels like 80 to 120 nanograms per mil. There's two different yeah. units. We can talk about that at some point, but yeah, right. there's, there's many who out and out advocate these blood levels, which have been shown to be clearly harmful. And I've pushed back against that. Mostly, again, just the evidence of it being less beneficial above a point. And so your blog opened my eyes about not only is it not beneficial within this high end of normal, but we can see out and out harm from it in this, in this range. Yeah, we can. And I don't have a good number on 
how many people are harmed at that level, but I certainly have seen enough people um, at that at that high normal level in that range um, have come in with high calcium levels. So at that point, you're already seeing toxicity. The, the toxic effect of vitamin D is high calcium level. So you're already seeing that. Um, you don't need to get to what our lab calls toxic if you're already seeing the end result of that. Um, it, it's it's interesting because yeah, so in nanograms per um, nanograms per mil, uh, how you define deficiency has changed over the years, and there are some people who are advocating for very high levels, and unfortunately, you're they're, they're advocating for levels where you will see problems. You may not see them right away, um, and with Shannon's Shannon's story was interesting because she had been taking that dose for years and she'd been fine. And that's kind of that's kind of the case with with vitamin D um, because it's a fat soluble vitamin. It will build up in your system over time, and you may do just fine with that dose. A lot of our studies that have looked at really high doses, they're only looking for a period of three to six months, um, oh. not years. So they're saying, well, it's safe to take this. Well, it's safe to take it for three months. It would have been safe for Shannon to take that dose for for six months for wow. a year. It wasn't safe for five years. Huh. So that's, that's one of the problems too. And, and yeah, the, the normal ranges are, are really tricky. Um, we've had, there are some problems with, uh, with vitamin D, just measuring vitamin D. One is that our assays are, were not standardized for many years. Hmm. So we had different amino assays and they performed well enough, um, but when you tried to actually look with studies, we found that a lot of these assays were inaccurate and you couldn't really compare the results between tests. Mm. And it wasn't until 2010 that the NIH actually uh, put together kind of a, uh, a standardization protocol for these studies. So now we have, we have this method of standardizing them. Uh, but a lot of the studies still aren't standardized. So when you see these studies that, that say, well, you need this range, well, were they using standardized tests? Um, a lot of times when you standardize them, you end up with, with higher vitamin D levels uh, because there are certain amino assays that now are found to consistently underestimate the vitamin D. Huh. Yeah, so it's, so it's kind of a fascinating thing. All these, these studies I'm trying to look at now that say, you know, this, the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency is very hard to pin down because one, we didn't have standardized tests. So it's hard to even know if, if those were accurate um, and two, you know, we, we keep changing this definition of deficiency. And really, when you look at um, the harmful effects of, vitamin, of low vitamin D, and these certainly occur, if you have really low vitamin D levels, um, you know, we know the harm, we know rickets, that's why vitamin D is in milk, uh, so that the children don't get rickets, they don't get these, these bone deformities as they're growing. Uh, but adults too can have can have bone issues when they when they don't have enough vitamin D, but that doesn't occur until your vitamin D is very low, um, you know, under twelve nanograms per milliliter. Um, above that, you really don't see these kind of issues. So, some people would argue, well, you know, there's other effects, there's other health effects that we're looking for, um, and what's the optimal range for that? We really don't have a good sense of that. Um, we know that under twelve, you get issues with your bones because you don't have enough calcium because vitamin D is really involved in calcium. So we know that we know that, um, as far as kind of vitamin D levels of 12 to 30, um, you know, those, those may be accurate. Uh, we, we have a sense that maybe that's too low, but we don't have a lot of good evidence for why that would be too low. Hmm. So I also like the 30 to 50 range because I've never seen somebody with high calcium have a vitamin D that was below 50. They, okay. they usually have it more in the seventies and higher range. Once we see high calcium, you know, and it's a, I wish it wasn't such a narrow range. It'd be nice if it were broader, that it was easier to get within. And <laughs> yeah, I, you know, the other thing is that it's uh, it can probably be lower than it, than it, than it is. Um, you know, like I said, there's not a lot of good evidence that say a 25 is too low. Okay. Um, and interestingly, it seems that, it may vary by, by person, by population. Um, there's something uh, of a paradox in black women, vitamin D levels and bone health. So we find that uh, huh. if you compare 
the vitamin D levels between white women and black women, um, black women will have on average lower levels. Um, you would then expect them to have more bone disease, but that's not the case. Um, when, when you mm. compare black women and white women who both have low vitamin D levels, you'll see bone loss in the white women, but not in the, the black women. It's kind of that's this paradox. Yeah. So, so maybe, maybe those ranges that we have, those normal ranges, maybe they aren't really normal ranges for everybody. Maybe we need let me, maybe we need a better method of actually measuring this because it, it seems that it's not it's not a very great indicator um, across the population of whether or not you're healthy or not. Vitamin D you know, along those lines, I've wondered about uh, BMI and vitamin D. I've heard that the obese may have 2.5 times lower levels at the same intake. Mm -hmm. and, you know, is that a pathologic difference or is that an adaptive difference? It's helpful in right. some way. Yeah. Right. It seems actually that it, it's a, it's kind of a, uh, it's, it's not even a difference at all because you can explain it by the increased um, uh, space for the vitamin D to go. So it's a fat soluble vitamin. Sure. You've got more storage area for it. And so it's all just kind of stored around. And does it really, does it really harm you? I wouldn't really have good evidence for that. Um, yeah. Vitamin D and low vitamin D is associated with a ton of diseases. And this is, this is why a lot of people think that, that, you know, we should be taking more vitamin D is that vitamin D levels, low vitamin D is associated with diabetes. It's associated with heart disease. It's associated with mortality. Um, chronic yeah, yeah chronic, it's associated with everything. Um, yeah. you can, you can cite most critical illnesses. Um, you say you can look at a lot of diseases and you'll find that they have higher levels of low vitamin D than the rest of the population. Um, this in itself led a lot of people to conclude that low vitamin D caused this. Now, as we know, correlation is not causation. Yeah. And I keep saying this <laughs> again and again in the blog posts because it's such an important concept. Um, it is very tempting to think that low vitamin D is causing all of these things when in reality, it does not appear that to be, that doesn't appear to be the case. We know that low vitamin D does cause bone disease. If your vitamin D is very low and your calcium is low, you can get bone disease. Um, but it looks like probably chronic disease causes low vitamin D. And so what we're seeing is actually the effect of being very sick, not the cause of being sick. Hmm. You know, yeah. one point I'd love to have you expand on a bit too, is that uh, people often do ignore calcium levels that are high or on the edge of that. And doctors can often ignore that. And when patients hear about it, it seems intuitive that, well, well, what, you know, calcium, calcium is harmless. How can calcium be a big deal? So it's, it's not intuitive how small changes in blood levels can have such a big impact upon the symptoms. So, so could you, could you address that for us? Or? Right, right. So, right. So with Shannon's story, as I said, all her symptoms were all due to high calcium uh, that was caused by the vitamin D. And yes, calcium is, is a very important uh, mineral that you've got in your body. Um, it's most people know it for their bones because that's our major storage center for calcium that's in the bones. Um, but your whole body relies on calcium. Your nervous system um, relies on calcium for signaling. So from signaling from one nerve to the next, that's dependent on calcium levels. Um, so your body tries to keep calcium levels in a very tight range. So you're talking about a tight range for vitamin D. Calcium is in a really tight range. Um, like most electrolytes, really, most electrolytes are kept in a tight range. But calcium has its own organ to keep it in that range. And like no other mineral has that. It's got its own organ, the parathyroid glands. Um, and when, when the calcium level ha goes high, you can get symptoms, you get all the symptoms she got, but you can get symptoms mostly like fatigue, um, bone pain, body aches, heartburn, headaches, um, you know, just feeling mind, kind of right? just general. Yeah. The, the <laughs> bones grown stones, but really it's, I, I, I de-emphasize the mnemonic because most people don't present with bone pain or kidney stones. They, they really present more with fatigue and a general malaise. So they just feel like something is off. They don't want to do what they did before. And they're not interested in life anymore. And they just feel mm. terrible. Um, so they, they can get weak. They just, they just feel bad in general. Um, yeah. And a lot of those effects are because of the effects on the nerves. Um, if you, if you mess up that signaling, then you're going to, you're going to get some, uh, some weird effects. 
Um, and that's kind of, that's what I deal with is, is parathyroid disease. Most of the time, like I said, high calcium is because you have a parathyroid tumor and that tumor is, is making lots more parathyroid hormone than it should. And that in itself is causing the calcium to be high. Um, high calcium, when I see it is usually not due to vitamin D. I'll say that it's, <laughs> I'm seeing it more often, but still most of the time it's a parathyroid tumor. So a high calcium level is a parathyroid tumor until proven otherwise. Um, and high calcium level, as you said, some people will look at it and be like, well, that's, that's good for my bones. Right. I mean, uh, high calcium is good. Don't I need it? It's not really, um, because that calcium level is like that calcium that's in your blood is coming out of your bones. So it's actually causing osteoporosis. So people with parathyroid tumors, they will lose calcium from their bones. They'll get bad osteoporosis, um, because the, the calcium is not staying where it should, um, so, yeah, so that's, that's the harm of high calcium. If, uh, if it is due to vitamin D, then it's got, you know, it's an easily reversible thing. If it's due to a parathyroid tumor, you do parathyroid surgery and take the parathyroid tumor out. Yeah. But a lot of people ignore high calcium levels. You gotta, you gotta pay attention to that. Some labs you can kind of, they can be a little bit off and that's okay. Calcium really should be in the nines for adults. And if it gets into the tens and you're over the age of 40, then you really want to look into that. So that's a great rule of thumb. So even, so most labs will say what, 10, four. So is the upper. Yeah. <laughs> they give this huge range. They, they'll yeah. say, they'll say 8.5 to 10.4 and really 8.5 is too low. Um, 8.5 is, it can, can cause symptoms itself. So mm. you're more, most that's people want to be kind of in the nines, um, you know, 9.4 to 9.9 is kind of the area 10.0. Um, if you're younger, if you're in your thirties, you can have like a 10.2, uh, but really it starts to, starts to drop as you get older. Teenagers can have kind of closer to 11, but mm. uh, yeah. So nines are fine. <laughs> is that the For most adults. Yeah. Most adults <laughs> who are interested in health podcasts, <laughs> it should be, it should be in the nines. Um, if you're really young, then you can have it a little bit higher, but yeah, mostly in the nines. And we've had many patients to where they've had severe IBS type issues. I can think of one woman specifically to where she had, uh, it would seem that foods were triggers and she kept trying to figure out which, which it was. Her diet got so restrictive, but she was debilitated in a lot of ways that Shannon was. She couldn't really mm -hmm. maintain focus or work any longer, had the GI issues. And when she came to see us, she was presenting with this and she had thyroid disease, which you know, we helped her optimize her levels and work through any lifestyle factors that could be relevant. And it didn't have a big effect upon her symptoms, but she was consistently in the high nines for her calcium. And mm -hmm. ultimately her, she, her with, finally, when we did look at that, we then evaluated her parathyroid hormone and it was high normal. And we explained to her, look, you know, your calcium's high normal, your parathyroid hormone should be lower to allow for mm -hmm. that. They should be on a seesaw. They shouldn't be on the same side. Yeah. So we did refer her on for evaluation. She did end up having surgery and it just changed her life. You know, we've seen so Good. many stories yeah. like that. So this is a huge yeah. thing that's really underappreciated. Yes, it, it really is. It's something that, that people need to be educated about because it is something you can fix. Um, the, one of the problems I see too, is people will get diagnosed. They'll have, they'll have a diagnosis of parathyroid disease but the doctor won't realize that their symptoms are cause, causing anything. They, they, they're caused by that parathyroid disease. So they'll see their doctor. I'll see the note. It'll say, you know, comes in complaining of fatigue, um, you know, complains of heartburn and, uh, you know, and, and has some aches and pains. Um, and then it'll say in the diagnosis, primary hyperparathyroidism, but it'll say, you know, can't account for symptoms. Um, mm. But no, it can. <laughs> it really can. And, and people do change their lives. When they have parathyroid surgery, their lives turn around. Um, you know, stopping the vitamin D on Shannon was sort of satisfying, but it takes months to see an effect. People who have parathyroid surgery, usually within a week or two, they, they notice they're sleeping better at night. They're waking up refreshed. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're getting their lives back. So that it's, it's a, it can be pretty powerful. And it's something that people need to know about and doctors need to be aware as well. You know, and as having a focus with lifestyle medicine, people always ask about, well, is there something natural I can do for that? Well, yeah, you can naturally get rid of that gland that's misbehaving. <laughs> right. 
Right. Exactly. It, <laughs> it's not, it's nothing that you did, you know, you didn't cause this little tumor and it's, it's not cancer. So it could stay in there theoretically and you would leave it there, but it's going to cause a lot of problems while it's there. And why not just take it out? Then you won't have to take um, all of these medications. I, I have had patients where the doctors keep throwing these very expensive medications at them to get the calcium down. Oh. Um, and I said, why would you do that? Just, just get surgery. Uh, it's it's really a, quite a simple operation, and uh, and most people can be can be cured with a short operation. No, it's a really satisfying thing when it's when it's detected. There's so few scenarios that are present where something that can be relatively simple and quickly fixed and so dramatic in the response is is yeah. often missed. So just such a big thing. Yeah. That's why I do parathyroid surgery. It's yeah. definitely very satisfying to to cure somebody like that and to to hear from them later where their their lives are changed completely. And just to, you know, kudos to you for that focus. And this is something to where we will occasionally hear people who will come across that need. And we always say, look, you want to see someone who focuses on that. You know, there there are many great general surgeons, but yeah, you want right. someone that focuses on parathyroid surgery. There's such a difference. There is. It's a very hard operation. So uh, once you get very good at it, you can do it fairly quickly. You can do and you can be very successful at it. Very minimal complications. Um, you know, it's an outpatient person. Doesn't mean that it's that it's easy. It's it's a very hard operation. And uh, and yes, even even really good surgeons will struggle with it because it's hard to find the parathyroid glands. And I think it's hard for people to understand that. You know, why would a doctor be unable to find an organ? Uh, mm. But they can be pretty tricky. I mean, the size of a grain of rice normally. Huh. And uh, a tumor can be the size of a raisin and wow. you're looking for it around some pretty, you know, delicate structures in your neck, the nerve that controls your voice, uh, the esophagus is right there. You're looking at the carotids. So you kind of want to be careful and you want, but you want to have a, an idea of where to look for all of these glands. And, uh, and that just takes a lot of experience. So that was the benefit of being at the center was it's, it's all we did day after day was, was parathyroids. <laughs> That's wonderful. So yeah, thank you for that. And vitamin D, please be aware, everyone, that it's you need it. We get a lot of questions about it now because of the relevance of the pandemic. And best I could see, looking at vitamin D's role with autoimmunity, which is you know our big focus with thyroid disease, and then general overall health, and then also preventive for COVID and preventive for COVID complications, they all seem to be about the same sort of range. The one of those three didn't seem to be radically different from the others. Would you would you give any different input on that or? Well, so, so in, you know, in large trials, um, vitamin D has been less than impressive at disease prevention. So, um, but in reviews of trials and meta-analyses, it seems that with certain things like infection, uh, vitamin D may play a role. And we have, we have sort of circumstantial evidence for this because vitamin D in a test tube will, will affect uh, immune cells that will make them mm. activate. So it seems that we've got some indication of how it could be involved. Um, it's not clear that someone with a normal vitamin D level or low normal will actually benefit from supplementation mm. because every time we try to study that and in our, in our large trials, we've got thousands of patients, we give them vitamin D, give half of them vitamin D, half of them get nothing. And we don't see the effects in the end. We don't see heart disease going down. We don't see rates of diabetes going down. We see we don't see mortality going down. We don't see any of this. Um, with in, ter in terms of respiratory infections, there are is some evidence that we may see an effect on certain trials. It's a lot of them are. Um, they're not definitive because a lot of them weren't looking at actual vitamin D levels of patients. They were just giving everybody vitamin D versus not giving them vitamin D. Mm. It's it. likely that people who are deficient do have a benefit. So, sure. um, you know, so with vitamin D and COVID, uh, I think encouraging everybody to go out and take vitamin D to prevent COVID is, is probably not the best public health message. Yeah. Um, you know, preventing COVID comes down to masks and, and washing your hands and kind yeah. of doing the social distance comes down to that, you know, preventing an infectious disease rather than taking a vitamin, which is, doesn't have a lot of, of evidence for it. Um, if you are really deficient, if you, if you have those really low vitamin D levels, then yes, you may be more susceptible to infection. 
and it makes sense to take vitamin D, but you don't need 5,000 units a day. Um, you don't need, you don't need the doses that you see over the counter. Um, I, I recommend, I take, I put people on usually a thousand to 2000 units a day. And that's if I'm trying to get the vitamin D level up. Um, if you've got a perfect vitamin D level, you know, it's, it's probably not going to help you to take extra vitamin D. You know, I've come to think about nutrients like, like keys, you know, if your keys are missing, your car won't work very well, but yeah. when, the, when the keys are there, if there's a problem with the car, more keys won't help. You know, it's it's something not gonna, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> something else. I mean, it's, and it would be nice if, you know, if we just taking more vitamin D could, could solve all these issues, but it doesn't really. I mean, if, if you've, if you've already got what your body needs, then you've already got it. Um, if, if you have something else going on, like if you, you know, if, um, if you do have a severe vitamin D deficiency, you will likely have a low calcium level too. So it's another clue. If you do have low calcium levels, then it makes sense to take vitamin D. That's actually the treatment for low calcium is to take vitamin D and calcium. Um, so if you have a reason, and I tell people to think of everything you put in as everything you put in your body as a medicine, um, think about it as a medication. So if, if, if I gave you a medication for heart disease, you wouldn't just, you know, indiscriminately start taking more and more pills. Um, and you want to know why you were taking them. So if I give you a prescription and I just say, well, this might help, you know, just go ahead and take it. Uh, most people aren't going to, they want a reason. They want an explanation for it. Unfortunately, we treat vitamins and supplements differently. We just kind of take mm. them just in case. Um, and that's, that's not really a way to look at them. It's vitamin D really is a hormone. It's like a medication and should be treated with the re same respect you give to a prescription. Um, you know, treat that like a medication you're putting into your body. If you have a reason to take it, then absolutely it's necessary. Um, if you don't have a reason to take it, then you're taking an unnecessary medication. And that's, that's really how you should look at that. Look at it. You know, something I've come to see and be concerned about, there was one time in which, uh, some one group of our patients, we track those on their intake when they first came in, the number of supplements they were taking, uh, the average number. Uh, do you want to, do you want us to take a stab at the, at a guess for what the number was or of how many they were taking? Yeah. You know, how many different supplements? Oh God. I I've seen patients that were taking over 20. <laughs> we have one group average 26. Wow. It's, yeah. it's just, <laughs> it's crazy. I, I, uh, and you know, a lot of the people who are taking these supplements, um, they don't always know everything that's in them. So uh, sure. vitamin D is very easy to put into things because it, it is so tiny. Um, and so you can pack a lot of it in a small pill. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that's why vitamin D gets added to a lot of things. Uh, huh. It's very hard to take too much calcium because if you take too much calcium, Physical size. calcium yeah, it's big, it's, it's unpleasant. It tastes like chalk. I mean, it's just not very nice. It's hard to get enough in, but with vitamin D, you know, you can get 10,000 units in a tiny, tiny pill. If you're making a vitamin and you, you know, you want to just throw some vitamin D in there. So I would, I would have people um, I would have patients come to me and they would say, I don't, I don't take any vitamin D. I don't understand why my calcium is 10.5. Huh. And I would have them send me a picture of the supplement bottles. And then once they actually took the picture, oh yeah, this, this has 2000 units and I take it wow. twice a day. And, um, you know, this other one for my hair has, has a couple thousand units and it's just thrown into these various, uh, you know, supplement packs. And if you're not paying attention, I think, Sometimes people that they, they, they just kind of assume, well, if it's, it's a supplement, it's pretty, it's pretty safe. You know, I could just kind of add them on um, and not realize how many they're taking and, and how that could actually be causing some problems. Well, and yeah, and then things in groups can have emergent properties that you wouldn't predict by the members of the group. They can act in right. ways that are completely different. And, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe in trying to minimize medications if, if you can and, and supplements, like I said, I, I treat them like medications. It's, if you need it, then, then absolutely your body needs that. If you don't need it, then it, it's not necessary. That's great. Dr. Diva Boone, really appreciate your time and great, great insights for us today. And uh, I'll put some links to your blog, uh, divaboone.com. We've got some great papers up already about the current pandemic. Uh, there's a great one you just put up about the testing on that and mm. the relevance of prevalence and accuracy of testing and the nuances that way and good things in vitamin D. So we'll look for more to come there. Great. All right. Thanks a lot. It was nice talking with you. Likewise. Uh, those who are here, thanks for tuning in with us, and I'll see you back soon for another episode. In time, take great care of yourselves.
Hey, Dr. Christensen here. Thanks so much for joining me for another episode. Is there a topic you'd like me to cover? I'd love to hear from you. Just go to Dr. Alan Christensen on Facebook or Instagram, write your question, and use the hashtag medical myths. Did you find this show helpful? If so, please take a minute and leave us a rating on iTunes so that others can know. Thanks much. I'll be back with you real soon. Bye-bye.